there is a scripture in Revelation that causes a lot of debate and confusion. It's in Revelation chapter 11. And it talks about the two witnesses. These are anointed preachers. They're going to come and they're going to be very persuasive because they're going to get a lot of the Jews that right now, many of them, not only reject the gospel, they outright hate you. I don't know if you, you've met that because we Christians love the Jews. We love Israel. I take tours to Israel. I love doing that. But the reality is many of them are really antagonistic towards the Lord Jesus. They take his name as a curse word. They're antagonistic towards Christians. They believe that we're always trying to convert them, and that's, you know, that's inappropriate. And so there's a lot of misunderstanding. Plus all the years of, you know, of history, they're taught that we were the ones that killed them in the Inquisition in World War II, and they didn't realize we were getting slaughtered in World War II, and we were the only friends of the Jews protecting some of them. And I've tried to tell some Jews that, and they say, well, don't boast about it. How many, how many did it? I said, I don't know how many, but if anyone risked their lives, I mean, how many, how many Jews risked their lives for, for Christians in World War II? You don't know. But the fact that there's a cemetery for the, for the righteous of the nations in Israel shows there are probably at least 20,000 that they knew, that we know for sure. 20,000 Christians were willing to risk their lives to love the Jews, save the Jews. And it wasn't enough. There were was, there was so many people that died. The Inquisition is another one that comes up all the time. You know, they believe Christians killed the Jews in the Inquisition. But did you realize that Christians were the victims of the Catholic Inquisitions? I say that now. I'm not, you know, we don't have any friction between Catholics and Christians. Not, not the same way. They're not trying to kill us anymore. But historically, the Inquisition was directed at Christians, Protestant Christians, as much as the Jews. And the Jews remember that they were kicked out of Spain in 1492. But guess what? We also had to run. The Europeans ran away, fled out of Europe. For what? For religious persecution. Who was persecuting them? The Catholic Inquisitors. And that's why America exists. Because people who were born again Christian fled the persecution of the Inquisition and came over here looking for religious freedom. Amen? All right. All that to say, all that to say, God's going to send two special evangelists, anointed preachers, that are going to convince many of the Jews, at least one-third of them, that the gospel is true, Yeshua is their Messiah, and they're going to do a good job. So the question that has been long asked is, who are they? Who are they? Do you want to know who they are? All right, so right now, throw away your preconceived ideas for a moment, okay? Go with me on a scriptural journey. Right? If we're in the end time, we're going to have to learn some end time stuff. And some of it is not going to be familiar to your ear. If I got deep into the things of end time, a lot of, thi a lot of things will throw you off. So I ease you in, okay? No false doctrine. It's all orthodoxy. It's all, you know, we believe in the Trinity, the deity of Christ, etc. All, all of the Nicene Creed. Okay, who are the two witnesses? There are several theories, and this is how you learn it in Bible school. Several theories. I'll give you a few theories, okay? Now, normally, I don't do this. Normally, I don't like to do this. You know why? Think about it. We do this in Bible school, but we don't do this when we preach the gospel. I don't start preaching to a sinner. There are three to 25 theories about how to be saved. Well, you could go to this person. You could go to that person. You can try this, and you can try that. And then in the end, I might mention about Jesus, and, well, who you choose is up to you. We don't do that. Because, why not? Because it would cause confusion. We don't want to confuse people. So I can say I've studied 11 major world religions. I haven't studied them all, but I've studied 11 major world religions. I wrote a book that is the, the manual for missionaries to go into Southeast Asia on Buddhism. I wrote the manual for it. Many mission organizations use that. That was nearly 20 years ago. From Buddha to Jesus. So I understand Buddhism, Hinduism, Sikhism, all of these things. And I can say, after having studied these religions, there is none that offers a guarantee of your salvation. See, so I, I would go to that. I wouldn't say, well, there are 11 major theories on how to be saved. Let's confuse you about it. I did the hard work, and I can tell you, you search for it, 
Nobody guarantees you salvation. Buddha gave 227 commandments for men. Westerners don't, don't, don't know anything about this. The ones that embrace Buddhism think it's cool and popular. They don't know it. But you know, Buddha gave 311 commandments to women. Talk about sexism. Gender inequality. All the people who love these woke ideas and at the same time embrace Buddhism, you contradict your own mind. Something is wrong because those things are incongruent. So we present the truth first, not theories. We try not to. Okay? When we're not sure, then we say, oh, well, this is our theory, our opinion. But I'm going to try to back this up with, with scriptures. And I'm going to ease you in the way that Bible schools do. Here are the theories. Theory number one. Who are the two witnesses? Number one, Elijah and Moses. Why do people say this? Well, there's no doubt that Elijah is going to be one of the witnesses. But the Bible says so. The Bible says it a couple of times. The, the Jews are so convinced that Elijah is coming that every time they have Passover, they will leave one of those seats empty. You know why? As a sign of faith as a sign of their expectation that Elijah is going to walk in any minute. And they expect him at Passover. So that gives us a clue when, he's going to, when the two witnesses will appear. On one Passover, those two will appear. And I guess they'll take the seat. The, the Jews will realize, oops, one seat short. Because two are coming. All right? So Elijah for sure is coming. And you, you find this in Malachi chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, I send my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple, even the messenger of the covenant in whom you delight. Behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Okay, so this has happened once in Yeshua's first coming, and it's going to happen again. Each time he gets introduced by a forerunner. Now, who's the forerunner? Malachi chapter 4, the next chapter tells you the name. Verse 5 says, Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. All right, so we know for sure there's no real debate about this. Elijah is one of the two. But as we progress through the revelation of Scripture, we get another clue. In Revelation chapter 11, verse 3, it says, I will give power to my two witnesses. Everyone, please say two witnesses. <laughs> and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. Okay, so they're going to come. They're going to preach for 1,260 days. We don't really like to do that kind of math, but that's three and a half years. That's another way of saying three and a half years. So who could it be? Well, people who believe this say, it's got to be Moses. Why? Because Moses and Elijah both appeared at the Mount of Transfiguration. And there's some merit to that, of course, okay? But if that's all we got, it's, it's, there's less evidence for this. I think, on the other hand, both of these great men of God represent the Old Testament. And that really isn't the purpose of bringing the two witnesses. We understand the purpose. Always go back to the purpose. If you don't understand something in the scripture, God has a purpose. He's not a silly God. He's not an illogical, irrational God. He has a purpose. And the purpose is update the Jews to the New Testament and realize Yeshua is the Messiah. All right? So that's one theory. Okay. Theory number two. Some people among us believe Elijah and Enoch are going to come. And you say, why do they believe that? Because both of them didn't die. Okay, Elijah was caught up in chariots of fire. He qualifies anyway because his name is named. But on top of that, you got Genesis chapter 5, verse 24. Enoch walked with God, and he was not. For God took him. Took him. That's, that's rapture language. Pastor Steve, it's got to be Enoch, because that's rapture language. All right. Yeah, but as I said, if he's a type of the rapture, then he shouldn't be here. And on top of that, he's not even a Jew. And Revelation 11 gives you, you know, more clue. We haven't read all of it yet. We only read one sentence. It gives you a clue that these are the, the, the lampstands, the oil, the, these are Jewish symbols. They should be Jewish people that are coming. So you might believe it, and that's fine. I'm not here to debate with you. That's fine. But uh, I think that because Enoch is a non-Jew, a Gentile, he rather serves as a type of the church, which gets caught away before 
the time that God deals with the Jews. Again, I don't believe in the great escape. I don't believe we get raptured because we can't handle it. We got too much heat in the kitchen. Uh, God rescue us. I don't believe that. I don't believe that's scriptural. I believe everything goes back to purpose. And God's purpose is to deal with his people, the Jews. Therefore, we're removed. And there are a few other purposes, but it's not the subject today. Okay. Elijah... Uh, Elijah's definitely in. Whatever theory we're going to propose or look at, Elijah's in. Are we all in agreement? Okay, I haven't lost you yet, right? Okay, all right. So theory number three, Elijah and...